Guys, thank you so much for joining me here today for a wonderful and exciting episode of Databased. Conspicuously absent is uh, Jamie, and that's because he said that you two would know more about the subject <laughs> than he would, and he didn't need to be here for it because he didn't have much to contribute, which I don't believe is totally true. But anyway, here are our, us three, James Cowling, of course, and uh, Sujay, your first appearance on uh, on Databased. So uh, Sujay is the third co-founder of Convex and the chief scientist here. So I've prepared a lot of really hard questions that I'm, I'm going to ask both of these two. Uh, Sujay is used to my questions. I tend to pepper him with, how'd you do this? How would you do that in, in Slack quite a bit? Because uh, I feel like when you, uh, when you work next to, to really great people, you'd be remiss not to try to uh, take advantage of all the things that are going on up there. So today's subject is something that's been uh, percolating for a little while, but has really become quite a, a common subject of conversation these days. And that's all about um, sync and uh, and local first database synchronization and offline apps. There's a lot of discourse happening around what is the best path for a given app or for a given system. Um, and to me, it feels like one of those pendulum things as everything kind of is. Uh, and we have come back to this place where there are really loud voices um, and they're saying local first. That was always a little bit ambiguous to me. Um, and I've really been trying to think a lot about what that means in terms of a, a user or a customer's experience. A lot of the time developers are talking about literal implementation details. And I come from an engineering and a product uh, background. So I'm always thinking about, yes, but why? Why does that matter? Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, that very first principle of like, why does this matter? So one of the questions I'd like to start off with is why? So there's this discussion around local first. Why would people the users of a product or an application or a system want, or maybe we should start with what local first is. Yeah. And before we do that, Tom, I kind of want to like, I want to like shield Sujay's qualifications here, right? Because we're going to be talking about sync and Sujay is a humble man. He's not going to do this, but he wrote the, the sync protocol at Dropbox. He wrote the desktop client at Dropbox along with his team and Jamie, actually. I wrote the server side, which is not as exciting as the client side, and also wrote the sync protocol at Convex. Um, so there's a lot of experience building synchronization systems, but I'll I'll jump in here and be opinionated real quick about local first, because I think when people say local first, in many respects, they're saying it for effect. And I hope they don't get offended when I say this. I think very few people be, be, truly believe local first. And by that, I mean, if someone truly believes local first, I think they mean the source of truth for your data is on your client. Now, that does mean if the source of truth is on your client, then you, you throw your phone away and your data is gone, right? So I think what people, when they say local first, what they really mean is we're so used to the cloud, we're so used to the internet, we're so used to information being ubiquitous and available everywhere. And I really want it to be safe and secure and stored in the cloud. And please don't make me keep my laptop in a fireproof safe. But... I want to have a good experience when I'm offline or, but I want to have a good experience despite network latency. And those are very reasonable things. I think if we want to really argue, should the client be the authoritative source of truth for state? I mean, we can debate that, but I, I doubt people really believe that. And I think they're almost saying it to, to push a narrative right now, which is, hey, we think the experience for developers and users in offline mode or with, with high latency is not good enough. Totally. And I also really like the kind of framing of starting from the product perspective here of like, we're walking through an app and saying both for on the read side when the user is consuming data, but then also when they're performing operations and doing things, um, what is the experience that an app should be able to provide. And I think part of the swing of the pendulum in this direction is that as app developers, sometimes we've gotten kind of lazy, right? We say that when 
the user navigates to some other page or they click on a button, that it's okay to block confirmation of that action on waiting for a network request to that centralized server. And saying that like users deserve better, that they should get really instantaneous feedback and be able to see things in the vast majority of cases without having to wait is awesome. But to James's point, like, does that necessarily imply a fully distributed decentralized world? Probably not. Yeah, and maybe for the purposes of this discussion, and not to be dismissive, there may be folks out there truly believe that like that the server is a secondary thing and that the client is the most, in, you know, all the data should live on the client primarily. I think it's probably not many folks because that's back to the days of taking, you know, backups and, and carrying USB keys around. So I think maybe for the purpose of this discussion, maybe we should frame it in terms of maybe, I don't know, stink, like, you know, like, like should the client block on communicating with a server to interact with their state or should they have some kind of local copy of it? And then there's a lot of interesting questions about how to keep that local copy up to date. Well, I mean, what I'm hearing are like the primary use cases for what we think most people mean when they say local sync is uh, responsiveness and performance in terms of like physically interacting with the the app or or whatever system you're interacting with. So it's a performance optimization on on one side. And the other side is, well, offline support. That is pretty self-explanatory. Of course, it'd be great if your whole phone continued to work while you were, you know, in the subway with no Wi-Fi and you, as far as you were concerned, you didn't, you didn't notice. Um, and then there is the idea of, so James, it's interesting, actually, the, the days of backups and USB drives, I get the sense, however, there is part of the local first community or narrative that is a, specifically about that type of um, guardianship of, of the data. There's like this, like, I don't, I'm sick of the cloud <laughs> and I want to own my data on my device and I want it to be physically here. Uh, I suppose that does go back to the days of, of backups and, and zip drives. Um, but frankly, how would a multiplayer application, any application that you use with other people in any capacity, how would you ever do that in a truly deeply local first way? How could the source of truth be on your device and on somebody else's device? Yes, I mean it. It can't. But so we'll just define what source of truth is. Right? So if if you know distributed systems folks have a few catchphrases they like using, right? And one is source of truth, meaning like there is data flowing all around the world with respect to your app. Probably it's on you know if you're now. Firstly, if we're talking non-collaborative applications, this is out of scope for this conversation, right? If you're playing a, a video game that you downloaded and it doesn't store anything online and you don't play with anybody else. It's not particularly relevant here, right? So we're talking about collaborative applications or applications where you want to access your content in more than one device. And so your data has to be available in more than one device. And if you want some kind of um, you know, local enhanced mode where you can use it offline, your data is going to exist. Different versions of your state are going to exist in different places. And then we ask this question about what is the correct version of your state? Because if I go on a plane... Uh, and make a bunch of changes to a document, and then I land and and you know get back online. Uh, which version is is correct? Uh, and this is like a the state synchronization problem. And so in distributed systems, you tend to talk about the source of truth, meaning can you point to a particular place in the system that stores the the exact correct version of your state? And I guess there's there's typically two ways of reasoning about this. One is saying there is a a single source of truth at all times, and that is your typical web app. Right. So you're interacting with your bank, you know, you're interacting synchronously with your bank and the transfers happening on their servers. And, you know, whatever your web browser is showing doesn't particularly matter in terms of the source of truth. Right. And then there's applications like Dropbox, like collaborative text editing, where everyone maybe has a forked version of that state. Right. And in those situations, you have to have a synchronization protocol that merges all that state together. Um, and Sujay knows a lot about this with respect to files, right? But 
you know, if you want to allow people to work offline and collaborate, there are going to be points in time where they've forked the state and it has to be remerged together. And some applications, it makes a lot of sense and it's easy to do so. Some applications, it's impossible to do so, which is why there is no like, well, I guess there's crypto, right? But even crypto is not decentralized because everyone's actually running the same blockchain, right? Uh, there's no you know, disconnected, you know, I'm on, I'm on a plane, I'm just going to transfer some money to Sujay and my phone just remembers that it happens, right? Yeah, you know, some, some applications are just not very easy to synchronize. Uh, I think like one kind of really interesting thing that we've all observed from working in the space for a while is like that question of what state is the correct state, like what the source of truth should be is often like a really deep and nuanced question. And it's something that often requires really deep, intimate knowledge of the application and of the product requirements. One mm -hmm. like example we talk about for Dropbox all the time is that people could go on a train and not have connectivity and rearrange a bunch of their files. They might like move one folder into another or like delete one folder or put some files. And when they came back online, those edits might be from hours ago and they might conflict with some other person reorganizing and doing their own spring cleaning of their folder structure. And in that case, deciding what the source of truth should be, deciding what the state synchronization protocol should converge to, really depends on like, what do you want users to, how do you want them to interact with their files and folders? It's not something that can be really solved abstractly or mathematically. It's not like, you know, a CRDT approach where it's saying that like, you know, just by syncing particular nodes and reconciling them in isolation, um, you can compute what the converged result would be. It's something I think that, you know, concretely at Dropbox, we involved a bunch of product managers with and came up with what user experience we wanted to provide. I think interestingly, like the, the sync protocol that folks, that software developers are probably most familiar with is Git, right? Because most people use version control for Git and they do exactly this situation. So they go offline, they make their edits locally, and then they have to do a Git merge. And most of the time it just works because, hey, it's just text files. They're pretty simple, right? But no one's Git merging, you know, um, PDFs or, um, you know, image files, right? And sometimes it doesn't work at all. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. And the developer has to go and resolve this. And, you know, this whole um, looping the developer in, in the process is a pretty bad user experience in many cases. And notably in the Dropbox scenario, there, there were debates that happened. So if two people change a file at the same time offline and come back online in Dropbox, mm -hmm. what actually happens is Dropbox just rena copies the file, keeps two copies, and it says, here's, you know, you know readme dot MD, Sujay's version, and here's James' version, and it just keeps them there. And it turns out with files, that's pretty convenient because you can just go delete the ones that you don't want, right? The alternative but would be- like putting it, it's like asking the developer to resolve their own merge conflicts. It's a merge, it's basically letting the developer do their own merge conflict. But interestingly, and pretty importantly, it doesn't pop up a modal dialogue and say, hey, go resolve these conflicts live. Because right. it's a file system. It's in the background, right? You don't know what's going on on that computer right now. Maybe it's a headless server. Maybe it's your asset. Like, you know, who knows what's going on on this machine? So I don't think there's like the user experience affordance to just block the the end user and say, hey, get involved and resolve this conflict. Um, like there is in Git. Because in Git, merging and committing is a very significant moment in your development workflow. You're ready to deal with the conflicts, right? It's so, a big moment in a developer's life. Yeah. For most web apps, when you're just interacting with a web app, that is not the right time to pop up a dialogue and say, oh, guess what? Like the state's messed up. Hey, end user who we don't know that we trust, go figure out what the state should be in the database. And that's that's the that's the tricky thing when it comes to offline operation. Yeah, that is like, okay, so there's so many things there that I want to touch on. First of all, you both answered like five of my next questions, uh, which was which was great. Uh, I, like down to the details, I was going to say at Dropbox, what happens if two people edit an offline file. And I'm like, those ones and zeros are are changed. How do you do? Well, there you go. The, it creates two of them. And later on, it says somebody with access, pick one if you want. Sujay, you also said merge strategies and reconciliation strategies can't be abstracted. 
uh, away. There's no perfect version that achieves all, which I think is that's very interesting. And it led in my mind to the question about it being wholly application dependent. So there are a number of understood and known strategies for reconciling files or data that is not synchronized, but that should be. But by definition, when you pick one, you are giving up properties of the of the other one. Um, and yeah. you can't and you can't have both. And I'm I'm wondering if that is at the heart of sometimes what is uh, potentially confusing or confounding for people because linear might handle reconciliation in a way that's appropriate to them, but Google Docs handles it differently. And as a user, you're never quite sure what to expect, except that you hope it works the way your intuition would have it would have it work, which might not always be the case. And that makes it that makes it hard. It makes it hard for developers. Is is there kind of like a right choice? Um, or I mean, I think like you think it's just like there's there's a subjectivity to the 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 reconciliation based on the application where there is one application you could choose either way and somehow you're going to have to communicate that or not but hopefully you do somehow to the end user to about what to expect when there's a conflict totally and i think you know at the end of the day like this is a design exercise right this is a product design exercise and i like it you know the word you use around like user intuition i think is really load bearing here like we talk about when we're designing sync at Dropbox, we talked about user intent a lot. And it is like the kind of really zoomed in version of it is that if you're offline and the app needs to be responsive, so it's letting the user do things. And when the user does something, they have some intent that is attached to it. They maybe saw some things in your application and then they took some, they had some behavior, they did something, right? And they did that behavior intending to do something. And the application then without any interaction from the user is taking that intent from maybe hours ago, maybe days ago. In the case of Dropbox, it might even have been years ago if someone did something offline, closed their laptop lid, put it in the closet, opened it a year later. It was their their Bitcoin wallet or their Bitcoin passcode. <laughs> exactly. So that intent has been you know transported through time and then is getting rebased or merged or whatever we want to call it. It's getting applied on the source of truth really far away in time. And then the, from an app developer perspective, how do I make sure that the user's original intent is preserved, that it's doing the thing that they originally meant to those months ago or years ago and not violating their intuition? So because this is just such a deeply human thing about like how humans, your users are interacting with the product. I think outside of toy examples, it's just very hard to, you know, solve algorithmically. And it's just like requires thinking pretty hard about users and what they expect. Forgive me for wanting to define the terms serializability and linearizability, because I think these are very relevant concepts here. A lot of listeners would, would know what these mean. So serializability is typically the best consistency guarantee you get out of a database. And serializability means that even though lots of things are happening at the same time in different places, you can go back and replay these events one at a time in a certain serial order and still have the exact same end result. And linearizability is a slightly stronger property, which says, how do I explain linearizability in a simple way? It's serializability plus external consistency, meaning if Sujay did something in the, in the database first, and then I did something afterwards, and we're in the same room, and we're communicating outside the database, it also obeys um, those, those causality um, relationships. And basically, what you need to know about serializability or linearizability is this is how the world works. This is how like, this is, this is it's an amazing paper by Leslie Lamport called Time Clocks and you remember the name, Suze? Time Clocks. And it's just like a, a seminal paper about time and causality. And at the end of the day, the real world is linearizable, right? If if you throw a ball at me 
It's going to leave your hand before it hits me in the face, right? And if there was a situation where somehow I got hit in the face before you threw it, it would blow our minds, right? And so computer systems that obey serializability, linearizability, map to our mental model of the world, right? And they look maybe what the simplest way of framing it, if you're interacting with a system that's serializable, it looks as if there's only one source of truth and one computer that everyone's interacting with in a single thread. Now, you cannot have serializability if people are writing in different places at the same time without locking or some kind of or optimistic concurrency control or backups, backoffs. So if you allow people to operate purely in disconnected mode, like if you, people go on their, on their planes and they're making changes in writing and committing and getting a commit back, you cannot have serializability. It's just a mathematical fact, right? And so as a result, you cannot have a system that looks and feels like the real world. There's just going to be anomalies. And there's nothing, no matter how smart you are, there's nothing you can do to avoid this, right? So your application has to choose situations where it doesn't matter that much. You went and renamed a task and I marked the task complete and then I deleted it. Well, you know what? We'll just Maybe we'll just delete that task because you know what? It's done anyway and it can go away, right? Or, you know, we both ch you know, changed the file at the same time Maybe maybe Sujay deletes a file, but I go and add to the file. Maybe we keep the file around because clearly I want it, right? So there's certainly certain application-specific situations where you can resolve these in ways that are sensical. It's not possible on like a you know mathematical sense to to provide just um, a general approach to this problem. Just can't be done. And the only way you can do that is to serialize the rights, meaning all the rights have to commit in a single physical location on earth, basically. I have a question about that. Go for it. Theoretically, if you were, if you were to let everybody do all this stuff offline and then come online, would it be possible for that to be serializable if the timestamps were of a fine enough granularity? Like if we're talking picoseconds and literally nothing happens at the same time ever, yeah, no. I mean, time synchronization is relevant, but it's not sufficient, right? Because causality is sufficient, right? And so if we're, if we're seeing, like, you know, you and I go to different rooms and we interact with the same object, if we're not seeing each other's changes, you can't necessarily reconcile them after the fact. Yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. So if we're, both, if we're both offline and we're, you know, manipulating the same, like, digital object, except you have actually moved it over here, and I'm over here, like, it's not here anymore, but I think it is, um, then my changes are no longer reasonably applicable uh, to that, that object anymore. And therefore, we have to make a decision, like, James is my boss, the ball goes where James puts it. And, uh, and like, and so that, that means, um, if I'm, if I'm understanding this, that even in the same application, um, it's certainly not like a blanket strategy for synchronizing uh, various parts of the of the state or of the data. To your point, if you delete a task in like linear or something like that, um, maybe that takes precedence over the renaming of it or an additional comment or something. And that's therefore the thing that wins in the, the great battle of, of synchronization. In other places in the application, uh, different strategies, um, simply like last write, for example, might be the, the correct product-facing choice. Sujay, do you have any examples of particularly tricky synchronization issues that you had to solve at Dropbox? Yeah, I mean, I think they... To riff on the ones that James had talked about, I think some of the asymmetric ones are very interesting. So like, for example, if someone deletes a file, but then someone else edits it, then we would make the product decision that the edit should win, right? That like, you would rather have the file contents around and lose the person's delete, even if the edit came in first. It was not necessarily like last writer wins there. But then there's some interesting places where we ran into situations in the reverse, where like, say, for example, you have like an HR folder, and you say like, I am putting in like Sujay's like performance review, and he's not doing really well, or something. And then 
say like in HR, we want to share that folder with someone else. So we then delete that uh, performance review because if we're sharing it publicly, we don't want me to see it. And then we share it. There's a very strong causal requirement there that the sharing operation has to happen after that deletion. Because if we do to some synchronization issues, um, like some race conditions from people uh, seeing different states at different points in time. Um, If we get into a state where we see the share operation before the delete, then I might see a version of that folder with my performance review in it. So those types of like figuring out which direction causality has to flow from a product perspective and then applying sprinkling that throughout the product was always something that we found pretty tricky. The other kind of classic example for us is that moves of nodes in a tree so like file system moves are just very very complicated because if you have a folder a and you have a folder b underneath it to make it so that the file system tree is a tree that it doesn't have any cycles in it you need to make sure that a is not a descendant of b right and preserving that invariant even when people are moving nodes around currently and they might go offline and rearrange things um, is a very hard to guarantee invariant and it's a very non-local one because you need to make sure that even if there's maybe thousands of folders in the middle we don't have the situation where b is somehow an ancestor of a mm, yes i want to go f- fuzzy test my my dropbox folders now <laughs> <laughs> to the point studio is bringing up i mean this is an issue um between clients and service. It's also an issue between services within an organization. But I think the, the point to really underscore here is there's no degree of like being smart that can fix this problem, right? In the Dropbox case, there was always like um, a lot of thinking and then some interesting product decisions that were made um, to decide what the behavior should be, what should the most intuitive behavior be. So there's just no way of being smart enough to solve this problem in the general sense um, if you allow rights to happen unguarded, right? So the issue we hear is in some applications, it's totally fine to have, you know, um, state be incorrect and, and to merge those. There's no way of having strong consistency. There's no way of having serializability or linearizability if you just allow people to do rights whenever they want. But there are ways to provide sync in many respects in a general sense if you put restrictions on what you can do with the rights. And in particular, I'm thinking things like um, locking, two-phase locking, or like optimistic concurrency control, or making sure all rights are kind of serialized in a single location. And these are techniques folks can use in the general sense to provide you know, strong consistency with sync, but you can't let rights happen offline. Okay. You can't have rights that happen offline like go and then attempt to update or write the real source of truth without some kind of intermediary process or, or algorithm or something to, to manage those incoming rights such that the database, it, it looks like effectively one right, right? It's, it's been... This is my issue with local first as like a blanket statement, right? Because it just cannot, it's just not um, possible. I mean, um, is it in, a, in a blanket way, right? Unless you're in a completely offline app that doesn't have to like share state with anyone. But if you have to share state with people, it's just not mathematically possible to have a full local first offline mode where everything's correct in all cases. Right? But it's a great opt-in model. There's many, many situations where, where offline mode is a really good interaction model. Google Docs is a great case. And there's many, many situations where, where um, the offline in linear, these these mostly are fine, but it's not like the default, right? So I think offline first, you know, in my mind, makes sense to say, hey, offline mode matters, and you have to think pretty hard about it, and then let's make databases, servers work really well, really fast, make state available um, in a consistent way on the client as the default operation mode. Yeah, I think one thing that always comes to mind for me is like, and this is an assumption I think that James and I both make, but an assumption we believe very strongly in is that programming in very weak consistency models is just way, way too hard. Like, I think, you know, you could say that you opt in everyone to fully local first, like with fully decentralized operation. If you say that your database provides you no guarantees, right? If you say you have last writer wins or any other kind of automatic merging strategy. But then 
I think it's some, one of those things that demos really well, but then trying to like build a real application with a complex relational data model where you can't reason about any consistency between different rows or objects, it just ends up being really, really difficult. And then once you require having stronger consistency, then you're in the world that James and I have been talking about, where it's just impossible to do unless you embed it within the application layer and the application participates in how it reconciles changes and deals with things being offline. It's a really good point, Suj, because yes, you can build a demo that's fully disconnected, state sync, whatever, because a lot of, um, there are certainly parts of applications which work really well um, in offline mode, right? And in many applications though, if you keep building them, you run into a situation where you do need consistency. You know, changing, I don't know, payments and 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 changing your profile information or adding someone to a team or changing your password. And these are situations where consistency matters, right? And there's not situations that show up a lot in little demos, right? They show up a lot in real applications. And my experience has been, and people don't have to believe this because it's not a rule. It's just a kind of it's a heuristic. it's a it's a it's an observation I've made. It's just easier to start with strong guarantees and then in certain situations loosen them than it is to start with weak guarantees and then all of a sudden somehow try to figure out how to add consistency on top of that. So typically having an application that you know has a real database that is actually stored in the cloud and actually runs in the cloud and actually provides serializability, but hey, here's your collaborative um, you know, image editing drawing app, do that part you know, um, with a CRDT or some kind of merge strategy makes total sense. I think it's pretty hard to start with the just you know, sync, last rider wins, let's cross our fingers and hope for the best. And then all of a sudden, later on, add add guarantees on top of that. I can't help but feel like, like most things, a practically optimal approach is some mix of the two. So we're looking for extremely responsive, basically feels like it's all running on your machine or your device and say works offline. Um, so to me, I picture a layer of the application that is a local first uh, database, but kind of a subset of the greater database um, that would be used for the full functionality. Maybe this, this database is there to be extremely reactive. And if you're online, everything still goes through it. Um, it just immediately gets pushed to the server. If you're offline, it just kind of builds up and then has to reconcile on the server um, according to whatever makes sense for the application. But it would also hold not everything in the database. I I don't know why, but I have this like vision of hardcore local first, local only um, applications with like multi gigabyte databases stored locally, and you're like running SQL statements on them. And I'm not, I just don't understand how that makes sense. But if you were to have like a really light, lightweight database that contains probably the vast majority of the information you're typically going to need during a, a usage session, and then that can then go and reconcile in the, in the back end. Maybe that's, maybe that's how it works, but I feel like you get the best of of both worlds without having to host, store a gargantuan database potentially, and deal with the basically the decentralized nature of trying to reconcile all those across um, multiple people if it's like a multiplayer application. I mean, I think like from other, like, you know, from the web development space in terms of metrics that folks use for evaluating product quality, right? Like time to first interaction is just really, really important. When you open up your app, you want it to be ready and, you know, have the ability to interact with the data model, you know, in maybe 100 milliseconds. And if that time to first interaction is blocked on downloading gigabytes of data to have in the local database, like that's a non-starter, right? And for any, you know, large application, even if it's just like, you know, task tracking, or if it was like, the file system state for Dropbox, the metadata alone can often get really, really big. And by the point, by the time that you're saying that, like, we can't block user interaction on downloading all of it, then you're in this view, like you in this situation, like you talked about, where it's like you have a subset of the data that's synced to the client, but the real authoritative data is somewhere else. 
Yeah, and I, I think there's another word for what we're talking about, which is caching, you know, uh, which is not a new idea. Yes, right? and like optimistic updates, yeah. like when you send something, the client can just assume it worked and then it'll come back if it doesn't because 99% of the time it does. Sorry, yeah. caching. Yeah. Yes. Sync can mean a lot of things to different people, right? And so there's a version of sync, which is like literally keep the entire database like in just unfiltered exactly as it is on my local computer and synchronize them back and forth. And some people might find success with that. I think it's not a model that will work for almost any sizable company because they have too much data. They have data they don't want to expose. They want to change that data, want to do schema migrations. Or for all these reasons, you don't want that to happen, right? And then you have caching, right? Which is the idea that you run functions or RPCs or some function on the server, get the result of that, and you keep it around for a while, right? And and then it's it, it, it's it's stored locally. Now people don't think of caching as as sync for good reason, because the cache generally doesn't keep itself in sync, but it can. You can, you know, you can subscribe to the RPC and, and get those results synced to you over a WebSocket. So I think sync starts to make a lot of sense when you start thinking about, hey, I, for me, sync means I want to call a function, give me the results of that function, and by the way, keep those um, results up to date. And you know, apply whatever access controls you need to do and filtering and and transforms on the server. I don't even know about that. I don't need that logic on my web app. I don't want to download that logic. But I want a certain set of data. I want my contacts. I want my chat messages, whatever I want locally, and keep that up to date. That plus the optimistic update problem, right? So there's like there's there's keeping the cache data synced, and then you've got to decide, okay, cool, where do writes go? Do, do a write synchronous? Do you have to block a write on the server? Or do you allow writes um, to happen locally and you know you sync them to the server in the right kind of application-specific circumstances where it's correct to do so? It reminds me a little bit of when Instagram was uh, first launched. Phones were very slow uh, to upload images. And uh, what they would do, again, this all comes back to like the user experience, what they would do is as soon as you take an image before you apply any filters uh, or write the caption or anything, they start uploading it immediately. And the result in practice was that it felt extremely fast when the user hit post because the image was already entirely or almost already entirely um, uploaded. And really it's like, it was like a, like a, a prefetch or or a cache in a way where it was like ready to go when you needed it. Um, but it was definitely, it was completely directed or as a result of requirements from the user's experience. So like that perceived performance, I feel like is what this all boils down to is like, this is us as developers trying to get as close to like a zero latency interactions well as we can while supporting use cases that are important but not that common like offline um it's like if we can achieve those kind of who cares how how we do it although it's interesting for us to think about and it's interesting for us to kind of pull together the pieces to make that work in our given uh, in our given context, which is also fun. Like there's a lot of, there's, it's actually like a pretty creative process to think about, put yourself in the shoes of a user and say like, what would I prefer to happen here in this case? And then go seek out what types of solutions or invent them. Yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating stuff. And it boils down to like, again, we talked about this last time, how humans ultimately interact with the software that we make. This makes me want to talk about commit points, but Suj, this uh, reminds me a lot of Dropbox LandSync, if you want to explain what that is. I mean, so Dropbox was a very centralized system, right? And that was really important on the product side, right? When Dropbox would show you the green check mark on your files and meant that you could throw your laptop into the pool and your files would be safe. But we would do something very similar to the Instagram upload um, type of optimization where if you were um, uploading a file, then you could also send those files to other devices on your local network and download mm. them optimistically. And then that would then keep that those chunks of files like cached, like kind of pre-warmed 
on the other devices on your network. So then when it was time for you to complete the upload, it could just magically appear on all the other devices in a way that like felt like it broke the laws of physics. That's amazing. That's a great, that's a great little, th- what a, what a wonderful experience, right? The lengths we go to, to make things feel seamless. Like I always thought I was w- like, why Dropbox feels, feels trivial. It's like, I feel like you could build such a system just by getting an FTP account and mounting it locally with curl FTP SFS, and then either use SVN or CVS on the mounted file system. Like and then you hacking. could just access that FTP account anywhere. <laughs> but here we go. You'd be doing great on hack and use Tom, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, doing things at scale with great user experience is hard, right? And I think um, to Sujay's point, so Dropbox had, has tons of interesting optimizations. There were optimizations like that inside the Dropbox infrastructure as well, where um, files would be preemptively moved around, et cetera. Um, but interestingly, even though with Lansync, the file gets sent over the local network to other devices before it's finished, the, there's a commit point. There's a when when the commit point is like the when the source of truth changes to say that Sujay's uploaded that file. And that commit point only happens on the server once that file has finished uploading to the server. Right. And so there's plenty of room for optimizations and systems, but this is this concept of a commit point is really important. So if anyone's ever designing systems or um if you're doing a sync protocol, you're building a lot of web frameworks with, with WebSockets, you are designing systems, right? And and reason that commit points is really important. And a commit point is like the line of code or the instruction in a CPU somewhere in the world where before that line, the operation didn't happen. And after that line, the operation did. And in all good system, you should be able to point to the commit point and say, that's where it happened. So in Dropbox, even though the files were moving around, the commit point hadn't happened until there was a database somewhere in San Jose, probably, that said the file is there now at a given point in time, right? And so the similarly for applications with kind of um, caching or offline mode, it makes a lot of sense in a lot of applications to stage things up, you know, to move things around. Like if you're in a, a shopping cart, for example, it might make a lot of sense to kind of aggregate and accumulate your cart locally without talking to the server at all. Right? But then you decide at some point in time, there's a commit point, and that commit point is when I click purchase and it you know, deducts money from my account um, and um, and you know, deducts items in stock. Now, in the Amazon case, I think that's not even the commit point. I think in the Amazon case, the commit point is way later when they ship it to you, but I think they're happy to tell you, sorry, that item's out of stock and refund you after the fact. So there's a lot of kind of application specific situation also if airline bookings is a really fascinating one too when you're booking flights and doing things between multiple airlines i believe in many cases they don't actually do proper two-phase commit they just do their best effort and they just know worst case scenario they'll just refund you worst case scenario they'll spend some money uh because it's easier just to pay someone off in some respect you know give you some free flights than it is to do things strictly correct but you know this stuff gets complicated and it should be opt-in right and so i think you know the model i'm going to advocate for and i'm sure sujay feels similarly is you know um rpcs on the server you know keep confidential complicated business logic on the server right results that are synced to the to the client and kept up to date so you have a local cache and you have your state locally right but if you throw your laptop away no problems right and then most of the time most rights should just commit to the server like a regular web app does because that's the simplest thing to do but sometimes if you have a specific use case where that's just not possible right you 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 really want to have offline mode or you want to have really low latency let people do stuff locally and know that that state might go away, it might be incorrect, um, it might fork, and then just reason about when the commit point is. At some point in time, there's gonna be a commit point where the source of truth is updated, um, but that source of truth is probably gonna be on the server. I like that. So in the Dropbox example of two people editing a file and there's two versions of it, this theoretical commit point, I mean, I imagine the server itself is is committing both of those, but like the user-facing commit point is when Somebody decides which one of those is the one. And it's like, okay, done. An application perspective, yes. Yeah. I mean, service perspective, it was the point in time where both, both versions were saved. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So is that, I mean, is that sounds like an awful lot like a transaction. Yeah. It's, a is, is, it's the same. We're talking about the same, uh, the same concept here. 
transactions begin and commit. Transactions are the most amazing things because transactions are about how you manage consistency, right? Transactions give the illusion of how things happen in the real world, even though they're happening on unreliable servers in different parts of the world. And I think even going back to what we were talking about with user intent and user's intuition, I think you can even bend that type of like design concept into transactions. Like if you say that a user, you know, when say they're interacting with linear, they create a task when they're offline and then they like edit the description for that and then write a comment. They may have like some other tasks that they looked at that formed their intent for what they were going to do. And then they performed some set of operations. And that package of some reads combined with some writes smells awfully like a transaction, right? Bunch of reads and bunch of writes that either happened or don't. And they either commit or they don't commit. And that's just how, that's, there's a reason we evolve these things. That There's a reason why systems look the way they do. It's not because people are silly, right? It's because we found that, you know, that, that you know, acid guarantees, you know, the, the databases provide are the most intuitive way of reasoning about the world. And I think it's, it, it's, it's really totally fine to deviate from those, um, those guarantees intentionally. But I think, you know, we've talked about edge computing before as well. That's it. Edge computing is quite similar to the sync stuff, right? It, it just doesn't make sense to put the source of truth in different places simultaneously. Uh, right. In the general case, it makes sense in certain applications. And then fine, start with the guarantees and then decide when you need to optimize things and very intentionally weaken those guarantees. There's a lot of uh, TCP, UDP vibes going on in, in many of our conversations, right? Where it's like, yeah, you couldn't really have a, like a, a web server or a website that just was like, everybody can write all the time. And it is what it is. Just no, no, no guarantees about what's in there. Your, your site's going to be all over the place. Um, you kind of need TCP for that to, for that to work well. If we solve performance, make that lightning fast. No, there's no way to differentiate whether or not this was local or not local. If we solve, uh, offline support, kind of the sim similar thing. And then data ownership, I think is, is maybe the third sort of more philosophical uh, stance on, on local first, but assuming we solve those, it doesn't matter how we've done it. Local first is just one potential means to that end, but it comes in as many different variations and flavors as there are people building local remote apps and, and, and hybrids between the two, um, because it's entirely and wholly dependent on the application at hand and how their users are expected or they think their users are intending to use uh, what they're building. Time will tell what will happen with, you know, the current local first movement. And hey, if the local first movement uh, succeeds in getting people to care more about offline mode and optimistic updates, then great. Those are really positive things. My guess is that folks who start with like a, you know, fully dis dis decentralized local first model, and then build a company based on this are going to end up with some pretty complicated code bases over time because it can be hard to retrofit guarantees into those. But I think, you know, I think as an interaction model, it makes a ton of sense when it makes sense. Yeah. And from like an API perspective, I think we've already seen this play out once with say Firebase, right? Like Firebase, it has a very similar programming API where you directly access the database from the browser or from the client. You don't really have transactions, right? So you're not like encouraged to group updates together. And I don't remember exactly offhand how much of like offline support they have where you can do writes when you're disconnected and then it will throw errors. But just from even a programming API perspective, like a lot of the developers we've talked to that have built larger companies or companies that grew to be larger, but started on Firebase, like had ran into tons of data modeling problems from the interaction with the database being spread out towards all of the different clients. Definitely. Not, not to mention, honestly, the access control and configuration that was required to support that sort of like direct client access has always been this very 
it's a foot gun. Um, it's been this very dangerous thing. And we saw that play out really recently with Arc, unfortunately. A company as as talented and competent as Arc can make this mistake at this scale. I mean, the the average developer doesn't stand a chance. And that that was the result of them trying something. I mean, credit to Firebase for building something really hard and interesting and very useful to millions of people. But James, this is exactly what you were saying, probably what you might run into at scale. And unfortunately, the result for them is that that is a very common tale as well, that it was very easy to get started on, on Firebase. Um, so like day one ease, but year two pain uh, big time. I'm, I'm, I think Arc is, I had no idea they were on Firebase. It feels like one of the largest scale applications out there. And they ran into a very serious issue and are migrating off of it. Yeah, and I, I don't want to shame the Arc team because real level for security rules are really hard to get right. And I also don't want to throw a shade on Firebase because we're huge fans and are huge fans of how kind of influential Firebase has been, you know, raising the bar in terms of, you know, database support for, app, for web application developers. But I do personally think that that's just a, a bad interaction model. I, my personal belief is just exposing your database to have clients directly talk to your database. It's just a, a bad model, and there's and you can, and, and you just can't paper over it. I think in it, and saying everyone should have row level security rules all over the place to resolve this, it's just too hard, right? And there's a there is a model that already exists that makes this problem go away, which is RPCs, which is functions. This is how we normally decompose programs. Normally, if you talk to a, a library. Um, you don't talk to the variables inside the library. You talk to the API of the library, right? Because then it's the library developer's responsibility, the module developer's responsibility to handle all this stuff. It's the same kind of argument with, with talking about sync here, right? Start with the right model. And the right model is probably data lives in one location and commits all happen in that one place and it's serializable, right? And then sometimes intentionally deviate from that, right? Rather than trying to create a whole new paradigm for interacting with systems that maybe throw away the programming languages world. I mean, it makes it makes a lot of sense. There is a future um, that I am sure of, and it's one where there is kind of no such thing as offline, no matter where you are on the planet and no matter what device you have. And it's not going to be in one or two years, but in 20 years or 30 years, like that is... That is what is going to happen. And speed, we're, we're only going to be limited by the speed of light, uh, which we talked about in the Edge episode as well. But we're all sort of constrained by that. And, you know, couple, like layer on top of that, the idea of keeping your system as simple as possible for as long as possible, as opposed to doing something really hard for... I mean, for the marginal, potentially marginal gains and marginal extenuating experiences like offline. Now, it's important to support, but to architect your entire architecture, you know what I mean, uh, to design your entire architecture around that use case and then all of the things that that entails and the complexity involved, um, it doesn't make sense to me. I, 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 I agree. We're vastly, we're vastly online. I think the simplicity of the system design has uh, more impact on the is, it has more impact on the success of of somebody's software project than their ability to like very cleanly support um, their entire application locally. It's more important that your app exists than your app works than that it works on a plane. Hey, it's better if it works on a plane, but you know, I would start simple, add complexity over time. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. Uh, this has been, this has been really fun. Thank you. Thank you both again for a wonderful discussion where I learned all the things. Any, uh, any final thoughts on sync synchronization local first? I mean, I just, I feel like there's been this debate on Twitter slash X lately about a sync versus RPC. I think my answer is yes right? Both are good, right? RPC functions are great. RPCs are amazing. And hey, sync to keep local versions of that state um, up to date. Great model.
I don't think we have to choose one or the other. My closing thought is like, I just think just sync is just fundamentally a very hard problem, right? I think, you know, for me, I think of sync as being distributed state management of like having many different pieces of state spread all throughout the world with different devices and different participants. And like, we all know that like multi-threaded concurrent programming is really hard. And that I think, you know, when it comes to designing products that work well with offline mode and work well where state is intentionally very disconnected, it's pretty hard and it doesn't, it's not impossible. But I think to go to what James is saying before is like taking a step back and always thinking from a product perspective of like, how important is it to work in a particular scenario in an offline scenario or whatever, and seeing if it's worth it for the product at hand. Because sync is hard, and especially at scale, all types of crazy things show up, right? Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, it's been it's been a lot of fun. You have a great day. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Cheers. Too.